everyone. Welcome to the final talk of the day. And it's going to be a little bit uh, interesting, I think. Um, Frank's joining me up on stage. And... But just like this. <laughs> burnt, burnt out, his t-shirt says, for those that couldn't see that at home. Uh, a little bit like how our relationship normally functions. Um, I'm just going to come up here and say whatever comes into my head and then Frank will interrupt me and tell me uh, what a bad idea that is or um, you know, <laughs> correct the mistakes that I make and that sort of thing. Um, so I'm here, I suppose, on behalf of the LaTeX3 project and it's worth very much thanking the other members, especially Bruno and Joseph, who obviously aren't here at the conference, because they've done a lot of the work that we'll be talking about. Um, but our, our relationship seems to all work fairly well, so hopefully they don't mind this. Our talk will start off, as usual, with a pretty general discussion of what the LaTeX3 project is, because every time we come along to one of these conferences, we know that there's more people that come along that don't know exactly what we do. And we never know when people might actually watch this recording, and um, I, I get questions from just general LaTeX users. What is this LaTeX3 project? When's LaTeX3 coming out? That sort of thing. So we'll address some of those points. As part of our work with LaTeX3, we have this thing called XPool3, which is how Frank pronounces it. Uh, it's a nice way to pronounce it. In my head, I always said EXPL3, which uh, just doesn't roll off the tongue very well. Um, we'll discuss that as we come through. <laughs> and in the second half of the talk, we'll discuss more specifically what has happened in the last six months or so. Obviously, Frank already discussed the, uh, the really exciting L3 build work that has also come out recently. So. LaTeX 3. This would be better for Frank to talk about because uh, I was not. <laughs> oh, when it comes to history stuff. Oh, well, basically, this is, this is uh, uh, divided into three sort of major blocks, and if you look at sort of the names, you will recognize, I think, most of them. The first row is sort of the initial project team that is largely responsible for LaTeX 2 Epsilon. Uh, Sorry? First Sorry, first column, of course, yeah. Um, um, with, with different sort of focus on, on various bits and pieces. Um, yeah, Michael very sadly died uh, in 2003, very young. Uh, he was doing a lot of the mess stuff that you nowadays know as um, AMS mess. And so on and so forth. John, this is Babel, known for Babel. And, um, Denise uh, was more involved with what we back then started to work as ideas for, for a successor of LaTeX 2 e um, The second block comes much later when Morton was um, sort of joining uh, the team and uh, revitalizing basically the initial ideas that we had in uh, around 92 and said this is never going to work, take it so slow. Uh, and he made it into sort of a second prototype, and then we still found, we, we put that out on the web basically back then, but, but um, I didn't sort of, still not quite got it, because we were still slow, but computers get faster and faster and faster, and, and, and so suddenly <laughs> the next generation of people showed up and said, this is really good. And <laughs> so, this was by the time when I said, I think it was a call or something, uh, goodbye, and the normal call, cowboy goes away or something, and then they came up and um, suddenly everything restarted very, very <laughs> nicely. And, and so finally we came to, uh, with Joseph and uh, Will, uh, to a new version of, of the core ideas that we originally had, much better than uh, after they sort of joined and got us all thinking about this stuff. And then Bruno joined us as sort of the last uh, core member with extreme ideas on what you can do. <laughs> and if you see his code, then this is uh, really fascinating stuff. Um, so yeah, so this is sort of the three major major blocks. And nowadays we actually have to show what we thought would be possible back then as something that actually works and is, is, is going to be used. And as, as I learned today, uh, there's yet another package that I never heard about is copy editing that is using uh, the core functionality of what we want to do. Uh, 
it's probably worth mentioning at this point, Thomas Lotz uh, handles the website for the LaTeX project. Uh, I never knew what he did. Uh, so just for all of the other people like me, now it's worth thanking the people that work behind the scenes on, on things like that. Yeah, and, and Javier uh, took over Beethoven. I mean, that's a very important step because Be Johannes wasn't able to actually do much more, so everything got delayed. And so for the LaTeX to evolve, that step was a very important step to get uh, good maintenance again for, for this part. I mean, the core of LaTeX is, is, is easy and, and simple, and whenever we try to fix something, then Carl gets upset. Uh, so we, 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 we do this only very sort of seldom these days, but um, for Babel it was very important to get, get uh, good support. So, yep. so this is what has happened over the last, this graph goes back to 1997, but you can see that things really started ramping up in about 2004 in the middle here. This is, this is Morton. Yeah. Right. This is Morton. <laughs> Uh, so Morton came in and he f basically made everything workable f by other people. This code, from my memory, it's a little bit fuzzy, but um, I'd read papers by oh, Frank. No, 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 no. <laughs> no my, the, my memory is fuzzy. Yeah. The code is always perfect. <laughs> uh, my memory of this was that the... Um, Frank had some papers out in about 1999, 2000, which had all these really exciting ideas in them. And then there wasn't really uh, something that worked very well that was publicly available. I think there was code there, but you had to work really hard to get it up and running. So Morton came in and tied it all up and made it available. And I think he was responsible for getting it all into SVN and then having a public interface. Not that he did the infrastructure, but that he sort of pushed towards having that being available. Correct me if I'm wrong. So I ran about that same time. I came along and was like uh, playing around and um, I suppose motivating him to get it actually working properly. Um, you then see spikes going in there and um, we don't, probably don't need to discuss all the different activities that happened in there. But you can see I'm this really faint blue line that more recently has shrunk down to almost nothing to my endless shame. Yeah, but it is. It, so, I mean, the, the last spike is, is the L3 build, uh, and that made changes to everything because we restructured the uh, distribution. So that spike looks, looks very high here for this year, but in fact, in practical mm -hmm. terms, it's not that so high. This, the other one is, is, is more real, this one around 12 and 13 less. Joseph doing the hmm. uh, so people never really know what LaTeX 3 is, um, unless, unless you're in this room. I think there's a lot of confusion around that. So maybe even here. Um, we assume that you know what LaTeX 2 is. Um, and so everyone says, well, LaTeX 3 must be the next version, right? So when's it coming out? What will it do? And that's not really quite true. We have to say, not so fast. Um, and to really discuss that, we need to talk about what LaTeX 2E is. And Frank had a good comment on that, uh, was it earlier today or, or yesterday, discussing the fact that LaTeX is a language um, for communication between technical people, or, um, or just between people in general. Uh, so you can't really go around changing the language on people without hurting or um, changing a lot of what has come before us. So LaTeX as it exists today, LaTeX 2E, just to read from the slide, must remain backwards compatible what's and all. And I think lots of newcomers to LaTeX often say, well, why are there all these things that, you know, this is an obvious thing, improvement that you should probably just make. <laughs> um, and so some people come along and they say, well, why is it, this looks, um, some cases they might say it just looks old fashioned by default. Why don't you just smarten it up a little bit? In, in some cases you could say that it's got questionable or controversial design decisions. Um, and I'm sure those of you who've used LaTeX a lot kind of know about that. You, the tables have, are a little bit too cramped. Um, there's stuff like uppercase italic headings, uh, uh, 
not headings, but uh, headers for in the in the book uh, class and stuff like that, which um, uh, really sticks out like a sore thumb uh, to me. But if we change any of that stuff, um, it means that old documents break because people work around those sorts of things. So um, we're stuck with it. Worse, uh, because you know you can always customize design, but but uh, in a much more um, important matter is that the programming side of LaTeX 2E is uh, very deficient. There are not enough hooks into things so to make changes cleanly. Um, you basically have to go in and hack whatever um, the definitions already are. Um, as you can see, there's there's missing or unclean interfaces to internal data structures and so on. Things like layers where you want to separate, as we were talking about, things like formatting and code. There's places where that does not happen at all and you just get a big mishmash. Um, there's things as well like font encodings which date back to the 1980s 7-bit era which if we could it would be much better to update that to something more modern. Again, anything that we change will break all old documents written um, with that uh, in mind. So we're basically stuck with the current situation of having an explosion of packages. Everyone wants to improve a little bit, so they write a package and put it on CTAN. And then about a year later, someone else almost does the same thing. It's, it's not that bad. Um, but we do have a lot of packages that touch basically every single part of LaTeX. And that's the other problem, because any changes to LaTeX we make will break any packages that do anything in there. Was that about right, Frank? Nothing to add. OK, I must be doing all right. Um, having said that, people in the LaTeX 3 project are responsible for LaTeX 2E, and we can fix bugs in it. And we do do that sometimes. And we've probably been doing it a little bit more recently than we have in the past. Uh, but again, um, we can't fix anything that we know people have already worked around and, and that sort of thing. I think the, the best example that I can think of of a bug that we fixed legitimately was for code called slash in at, or is it slash at in, which um, is, a, is a, a function that searches for a substring. So if you've got a piece of um, characters that say A, B, C, D, E, and you want to know if A, B, C exists in that string, it just says true or false, pretty much. And there was a bug in that. Um, we figured that no one had assumed that the bug existed and it was just a real simple fix and made it better. That didn't cause any problems. Uh, it was a pretty weird... Okay, nobody well, no, nobody complained. <laughs> um, it was basically... Um, I can't remember the details now off the top of my head. It, it was There was a false positive or a false negative for a very small set of um, strings that you could input. Um, never mind. However, more recently, we have made changes that we thought were harmless. Um, can you think of anything off the top of your head? Right. Just a bit later. What else? <laughs> <laughs> uh, luckily for us, the things that did break were by authors that were active and we could make sure it all went smoothly in the testing phases. Um, but basically what we're saying is that we can't change very much. <laughs> Improvements just don't work. So... Um, there's one, there's one oh. thing that I would like to, to, to add to this. I mean, back then we thought it would be a good idea in this file fix up its to e and put in all corrections that we think we cannot make to the kernel code for precisely that reason, but actually should be made. So either improvements or corrections of one, one way or the other. So for example, the LaTeX output routine uh, is broken as far as flow, flow, uh, double column floats are concerned. So double column floats can, can go out of sync. Yes. I mean, I don't know if you, uh, you 
people are nervous. But, uh, yes. It is just they, they, there is no check being made if there is a single current flow uh, in of the same type already being typeset. So it shouldn't get typeset uh, while the double current flow is waiting. So it is not being checked. So I put in that code into fix LTX 2E. Uh, to e to actually make that algorithm work correctly. I mean, it, it, it obviously never worked in that, that situation. But the, the problem with these kind of things is we now have a package that has these corrections, but now every package out there, in some sense, would need to decide or check whether this document is running on the broken stuff or on the non-broken stuff. In other words, every every package starts getting dependent on whether the author puts this in. So the situation doesn't really improve with the idea of trying to do this. this, this and this which thing. version of fix so, yeah. Yeah, that comes, comes on top of it. Oh, well, yeah. Right, so, so I wonder, could you put a fix in an individual package, though? What if you said, what if you had LTX2E fix output routine? And who's package? going to load this? 55 packages or whatever. <laughs> a user who has the double column, who experiences oh. the double column breaking. Well, he moves the figure. Uh, <laughs> the line. Well, it's the thing you can always fix the thing. <laughs> no, you're right. I mean, there are a bunch of ideas. Uh, no, you're right. It's oh, probably not worth it. What I'm, what I'm just trying to say is, uh, in some sense, you, you, you will will never find an optimal solution right. to this problem mm -hmm. other than at some point say, okay, um, there's a cut and you, you, you have to decide whether you run right. with one version or with another version. Um, it's just, a, I mean, this is not solving the problem as much as you want. That's basically what I'm trying to say. I think it might be worth mentioning at this point, though, that LaTeX um, great stability over the last 20 years is actually much more of a benefit than these like minor complaints that we're talking about now. So um, uh, I think we should think about this as a as a positive thing, really. The interesting point of this is, uh, nevertheless, that um, many users do complain about this problem up to the point it affects themselves. So there's always the trade-off. They never see the connection between the two. <laughs> so this is okay. So uh, <coughs> LaTeX two is here to stay, and that means when you're running LaTeX on the command line, LaTeX or PDF LaTeX, um, it's not going to change. So that means whatever LaTeX three is, uh, it won't be a replacement. So it's not going to break anything. Uh, by necessity, it will always be an alternative, perhaps a better alternative, perhaps a different alternative. Um, but because LaTeX 2E has this package concept, it means that a lot of the ideas that Frank has and that we implement for Frank, um, <laughs> some of these can be layered directly on top of LaTeX 2E so that a lot of people can benefit from that. Um, and so the, the best examples of this is the XPool language itself, which, um, as we'll see in a second, is, is starting to be used by quite a few different LaTeX package authors, um, as well as things like XPars and so on, which uh, basically are intended to make everybody's lives easier. And um, basically, that's the reason that I'm involved in, in all of this, is to try and help people out. But not everything can be layered on top of 2E because of basically this problem that we're talking about. If we want to implement an entirely new model for, for example, output routines, like Boris was talking about, that will uh, basically clash with every single package that's been written that interacts with the output routine. Output routine is, you know, is, is one of the things that I still would believe is possible. You could switch it in and out because there are not so many things that actually interact. But uh, this example of the galley, which is an idea to get out of the problem that you have with, with stuff like um, one signals for, for color and stuff, which the way it is done, so that um, certain things don't quite work in tech very nicely and in later. And we have a completely different model for, for producing sort of text 
galleys. The problem is everybody is, is sort of messing around with the current sort of text model of, of LaTeX. So that, if you put this in, 90% of the packages stop working if they are not aware of this. So those are the kind of things that only work if you have a consistent model throughout, and that's the last part. So the idea is definitely to go by the end of the day to a consistent new system rather than to something which runs on top of, of later to a side. It'll be pretty weird, I think. I'm sure. <laughs> so um, it's worth mentioning that LaTeX 3 is not XPool 3. XPool 3 is a, a nicely defined thing, and people can use it today, and it's helping lots of people in 2E and, and etc. LaTeX 3 is this nebulous, incredible future that Frank has a good idea in his head what it might look like, and the rest of us are trying to figure that out at the moment. <laughs> Maybe it should look like. Uh, well, I gave, gave an article, uh, and a talk about the architecture in the UK. Mm, yeah, exactly. That's what I said to you. Yeah. But anyway, uh, it is important, this bit here, X, XPUT3 or whatever you want to call it, it was the name, the strange name is Experimental LaTeX 3 Language. Uh, it got stuck because we published it uh, by the time when this, this name was known. Um, I haven't come up with good uh, um, experience, whatever um, <laughs> thing, as a, as a new name. But the point is, this is the bottom layer. It's, it's a foundational language for programming differently from what you normally do with, with macro expansion programming. And we ended up with something which is very nicely consistent, and that is really what, once you got over the first initial shock about suddenly seeing colons and underscores, <laughs> is actually, is actually very, very helpful, and people start appreciating that, and this is... We'll see a couple of really, really short snippets about later on. Yeah. You can do this oh, as well. what happened? See, I, I oh, can yeah. do it. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> uh, we'll have, we'll have to speed up a little bit, because we... Yeah. Um, we haven't even, I don't know, got That's half. That's good, so we don't come to the last part. Right. <laughs> last part's what I did. Uh, we'll skip over this quickly. This XPool thing was uh, written originally in something like 1992. So it's um, interesting to think how far <laughs> we've come since then. And forms this programming coding layer for LaTeX 3, used by other people now as well. Um, Lots of people nowadays might say something like, why not Lua Tech? Why don't you do all of your programming in Lua now? Well, it's worth kind of considering that this XPool idea dates, in fact, predates the programming language Lua entirely. So uh, the thing about XPool 3, though, is that it works on both PDF, or all three of PDF Tech, ZTech, and Lua Tech, and these three engines all have active users at the moment, and they all do different things for different people. So there's no clear replacement at this point. It's more like uh, an ever-widening horizon. Um, also, we should discuss the fact, and um, Boris's talk is a good example of this, where it's not necessarily the programming that is the hard part. It's the actual conceptual algorithm that's the difficult thing in the first place. So um, whether we're writing that in XPL or Lua isn't the big qu uh, question. It's just that if XPool gives us enough uh, facility to r write the algorithms that we want, that's, that's what we're looking for. Yeah, it's an abstraction. I mean, this is the point. Lua, Lua, uh, Lua Tech has a very, interest, very interesting idea. It's, it's mixing two completely different sort of paradigms. So you program in, 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 on one side in, in sort of macro expansion language, and on the other side it's something completely different. Which is fine if you're, if, you're, if you're happy with this kind of concept. Here, this is trying to get a single sort of consistent language, which also will work on your, your own Sebastian boxes or something. <laughs> <laughs> Not out of the box. <laughs> if it would be Lua, it wouldn't. Hmm. Right. Um, but we love Lua Tech and we love Lua and everything that people are doing with that. It's just that we're not um, doing that ourselves. So, Expo, uh, we sort of said this, the goal is to make it easier to write LaTeX packages. 
Joseph and I have been really into it because we have written our own somewhat large LaTeX 2E packages themselves, SIUnitX for Joseph and FontSpec for me. Uh, and then we've both got other packages as well on top of that. And writing them with XPool allowed us to do a lot of iteration and solidification and consistif uh, consistification, <laughs> etc. Um, and I just wanted to point out that there have been a couple of other programming layers that have been put into LaTeX. Uh, such as eToolbox, but basically XPool is the biggest and most comprehensive and most consistent of these to date. So um, if you're not already, it's, it's worth kind of checking it out at some point if you'd like to write a few LaTeX macros here and there. Now, oh, you messed it up. Yeah. I messed it up. Is there anyone in the room that writes in, in plain tech? Or some text. Some text. Excellent. Yeah. Well, you're now in luck. You can load XPool 3 on top of plain tech and even in context if you if you want. Wow. So, um, yeah, the, the, the main reason the reason was I got he came to me on, on, on the doctor um, meeting and said, Can't you make XPool 3 available on all platform on all machines? Because I don't like to have to maintain my generic packages for all flavors. I would like to write them in one language once and basically have them available on all the different machines. So that's that's what we said, okay, Michael, in case of Michael, we might be actually considering this, right? <laughs> <laughs> I, I had suggested it um, a couple years earlier and uh, Frank just ignored me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's fine. So it seems to have been a success. Um, I compiled this uh, probably a couple of months ago now, but I found a, um, I searched through C10 and found a whole bunch of packages that use XPool 3 um, for a whole bunch of different things. Um, traditional style citations in the classics, a graph data structure, um, support for CJK documents in, in ZLaTeX, and uh, as of today, we discovered this new one, copy editing, which we're um, interested, exciting to see. So um, it's not just us weird LaTeX 3 people that are using this now. And if you go to the site stackexchange.com and search for a LaTeX 3 or XPool um, tag, there are a, a thousand questions. Well, that's, yeah, I have a lot of answers, but this is, um, to be honest, also true because of the person who gives the best and most of the answers on the site started to love this, that we give a lot of answers in XPool 3. Well. <laughs> and it's not one of us. <laughs> yes. Um, so, to, to, to keep on advancing, uh, what's new in the last six months is Joseph's L3 build, which, um, like Frank said, it was a bit of a collaborative effort where Frank kind of came up with the ideas and then Joseph did the Lua code and I did the documentation. Uh, and I'm really excited for that because I think the LaTeX community has missed something like this to do easy unit testing up until now. And uh, we could even imagine um, testing distributions with it, not just uh, packages and so on. Uh, we already mentioned that Expo now loads on plane and so on. And for the, the rest of this talk, we'll discuss um, just some basically ideas that we've been throwing around in terms of what we'd like to um, start addressing. Do, do we know how much time we have to? Seven minutes. Seven minutes, wow. Well, let's see how we go. So case switching, um, as in making text uppercase and lowercase, turns out it's really complicated. and um, then uh, just the other week, I started playing around with something, and then Frank complained about it. So uh, we'll see if we've got time to discuss what that is. <laughs> so case changing. Um, let's say you've got a string. You can, you can uppercase a string and make it all capital letters. You can lowercase a string and make it all lowercase letters. Um, and it's becoming more common to do things like title casing a string, where you might make the first letter capital and the rest is lowercase. Um, <coughs> Sorry, Barbara? Except for things like copyright. Except for, well, you need to make sure that you protect things. And um, uh, there's this thing called case folding, which we'll talk about, which is a way of normalizing strings so that you can compare them and do data um, manipulation on them and so on. And it turns out that in the Unicode era, text uppercase and lowercase commands are just not really sufficient anymore. You can have one to many mappings. For example, if you're uppercasing, the um, sharp S goes to two S's because Unicode doesn't have the capital sharp S as a character, or as a, as, 
Well, as a character, as a character, it doesn't. It doesn't. Yeah. It it doesn't stop a font from having a glyph uh, that has that. But anyway, um, you can also have many to one mappings, uh, which complicate things as well. Now, it's uh, Unicode gives us a lot of data now to uh, so that you know we don't have to reinvent. And and at the other hand, yes, uh, it screws everything up because it it doesn't provide a good solution from. Um, the perspective of the people uh, writing support for this sort of stuff. Now, um, just to jump over things real quickly, uppercase and lowercase in tech kind of look a little bit like this, where they don't exactly behave like you'd expect, uh, because it all happens in tech stomach if you're used to the analogy. Uh, but um, this is basically how LaTeX 2E um, works in terms of its make uppercase command, which um, has some extra code in there so that the idea of make uppercase is to feed it actual text. Uh, LaTeX has this idea called LICR, which is... Uh, LaTeX internal character representation. Perfect. So, <laughs> so you, you don't only have uppercase, lowercase characters like ABC and whatever, but also accented... Um, sorry, not accented commands, but commands to do accented letters and commands to do accents and that sort of thing. And you have to be careful to make sure that all works when you're doing the uppercase and lowercase and stuff. It turns out this becomes really complicated in Unicode, and uh, there's in source 2e it has a bit of a, a nice little bit of um, uh, documentation. These commands have some nasty features, such as uppercasing mathematics and environment names and labels. And if we could, we would use a font that just instead of having lowercase letters in it, everything went uppercase. But these aren't generally available. Now. These days, actually, in font, font spec, we could fake that for any font that you gave it, if you're using ZTech and LuaTeX. But in PDF tech, we still don't have an easy way to map all of the lowercase letters in the font to uppercase. So um, I'll check that out at some point in the future. But what we're talking about today is about manipulating the letters in the first place. Say again? But on the fly? Doesn't that need write 18? Hmm. Yeah. Well, if we can do it, then that would be pretty fun. But but that doesn't solve the problem of, for example, if you're looking for file names and you need to lowercase the letters and then search for the file name again, you know, there's other programmatic concerns which are different from the typesetting concerns. Um, but it's worth mentioning that we, we're not trying to tackle the, the full-blown text problem yet in... Uh, in Expo 3 because text is complicated. Um, and doesn't belong there, actually. Well, and doesn't belong there. Expo is for programming, and we really need a, a higher level thing to deal with text in terms of paragraphs and sentences and words. That should make uppercase. Hmm. Um, so it's worth mentioning that LaTeX LICR mechanism um, is basically more comprehensive than Unicode or has the potential to be. You can construct arbitrary accents and, and that sort of thing. Which, uh, and for things like mathematics, that's almost essential because mathematicians are always inventing new symbols and that sort of stuff. If you restrict yourself to Unicode, you are basically saying, I'm never going to invent any more mathematical notation. So, might be a good thing. Uh, OK, so what we're talking about then is feeding just plain old characters into these commands and, and mucking around with them. So um, we'll distinguish between, we've already said this, you can do stuff with text and we're not, we can't really do too much with that today. But there's uh, programmatic stuff that can be useful for people and that's why we've um, made this available now. So let's look at some examples. This is the code, code folding thing, which is intended to normalize text no matter what language it is, if it's uppercase or lowercase. After you fold it, it means it's normalized and you can reliably compare two strings. So uh, just check out that highlighted section. Case folded text should be used solely for internal processing and generally a user will never see this. It's from Unicode manual. Right? Th that is from the Unicode manual, sorry, yeah. So uh, this is the weird expo notation that you saw and you can see we've got a few examples here where in the first case, just regular ASCII, A, B, C, D, E, F, gets normalized to lowercase. Uh, there's a few 
um, things with the Greek sigmas that you want to make sure they're all normalized, so an, an ending sigma and a middle of the word sigma, basically the same letter. Uh, and there's even things in Unicode where they've got glyphs for, or characters if you like, for ligatures, which, which you want to break apart and represent as their underlying characters. It's a, a bit of a long story. Um, we don't really have time to discuss the implementation of this, but it's entirely expandable and not ridiculously inefficient. And there's a, a clever algorithm invented by Bruno uh, to explain how that happens. And you can see it's got quite a few um, uh, definitions like this, which help to look up the correct characters at the right time. You can probably t look at this and then figure out how it works, to be honest. But it's worth mentioning. Uh, so this is works over all of Unicode in if you're using Z Z LaTeX or Lua LaTeX. If you're using plain PDF LaTeX, then you, you're just stuck with ASCII as usual. Thank <laughs> um, you. Any, anyway, never, never mind. So um, I'm running out of time. So we'll just sort of say um, this stuff is expandable. So it happen, you can do it inside of messages and so on if you need to uppercase or lowercase when you're writing to a file and that sort of stuff, which can be useful. Um, and it's like bib tech in that if you put braces around a string, then it, nothing happens. So we've got some normal text here with the braces and that middle normal remains lowercase. So that's important for dealing with bib tech strings and stuff like that. Uh, here's kind of where it gets a little bit more complicated with the Unicode stuff. You can see at the top there's two examples which don't take any language information. We're just taking in this text assuming that it's just generic uh, language, doing the uppercase or lowercase correctly, as you can see. But if necessary, you can also specify an optional argument to say this is Turkish, and therefore when you, you can come down here and see when you uppercase the little, the little letter I, turns into uppercase I with a dot on top. Is that incorrect? No, that is correct. I'm shaking my head in Turkish. Not <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Um, so these are uppercase and lowercase functions. Uh, we also have a mixed case function and in, in fact we argued a lot about the name of this. So colloquially when people say title case they are talking about when you have say a magazine article and you want to make all of the letters, all of the words have initial capital letters except for some and so on. <laughs> and again we're not dealing with text here we um, so we're not dealing with words or anything like that. So if we have Frank we want to capitalize the F. If we have quotes Frank, we've actually got some clever code in there to ignore the quotes and we get capital Frank in quotes. Again, we can put in some language information and if we say, uh, sorry, I'm not Dutch, uh, ISA in, in Dutch, then the IJ is a single letter in Dutch and it gets capitalized even though it's two Unicode characters. <coughs> but again, if you try and put in multiple words, where uh, we don't handle that situation. So only the first letter in all of these strings will be uppercase. Yeah, yeah, that's the higher, higher level function. Exactly, so not text, just, just a string of characters. If it's a space, we're not interpreting that as a word boundary, if you like. Now, to extend that to title case is really fun. Um, and the people have written blog posts and there's lots of code for doing this sort of thing where, let's say, this is an uppercase title turns into this is an uppercase title, if you, if you get it. Uh, but the thing is, there's no standard way to do this. It, you can read different style guides from different, uh, different publications. And you know, they'll have a different list of words to ignore. And if you really want to get fancy, there's you know, stuff like iPhone and w dumb words like that, which obviously you need to handle somehow. And then there's some extra rules in terms of what happens with the first and the last. So, uh, you know, this stuff isn't impossible to do algorithmically, but you need to have hooks to, to act on it. And it's, again, at a different layer than what we're talking about. So this will be fun one day, but not now. Because we're out of time, the rest of the talk isn't really that interesting. So uh, <laughs> I'm happy to leave it here and invite any questions from the audience. Thank you very much.
I think the intention is that the new programming language will be used and not old. But is there enforcement of that? So I say again, there will be. Is there enforcement of new Are people who write uh, packages, styles, yep. that require Expo 3, are they forced to use the new programming language exclusively? Well, technically speaking, no. Um, you can mix and match. I'm, not, I'm guilty of doing that. <laughs> if, I'm, if I'm very quickly sort of trying, building, doing something like that. But... Um, Morally, yes. Well, let's say, <laughs> let's say it this way. There's a package out there, and in Expo 3, we have a stable part, which we say, this is stable, this is defined, this has a 200 page uh, reference manual, everything. Then we have a certain part which we call experimental, which is outside the kernel where people can use it and stuff like this, but we really are not sure it might change, stuff like that. When we do make updates, changes, or whatever, we are very carefully to look out on what is already out and see some people using it, in case there is, is a reason that something needs to change for, even if they thought it was stable. Um, we would not consider a package which is completely mix and match, I would say, I would just ignore. <laughs> so that would be my, my, my sort of, sort of um, boundary, because the idea is we, don't, we precisely don't want to get into this mess of having in interface mix up that prevent updates further on. Expo has a very clear separation of public interface and internal interface. Internal variables which are only within the package start out underscore underscore uh, of functions and stuff like that. So nobody else is supposed to use your internal interface function for doing something in somebody in, 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 in a different package. That's that's very clear sort of separation of layers that we build in and that helps. The moment you start and mix and match stuff with say two e commands and here a bit and there a bit, you end up in precisely the same situation as has been in the past. So I think that's that's the morally yes, practically no. Another question. Um, so let's say there's the, uh, the technical chief of a journal decides to revise the class of that journal tomorrow. Should he use Expo 3? If it helps, yes. I'm not quite, not quite sure what, what he mean was the question. Right now, um, which what we consider stable is, is workable and it will normally not pose more problems than a normal 2E situation with several packages loaded. And probably uh, could, less. Could, <laughs> sorry, and, and probably less. Yes. <laughs> so, but yes. But is, is he, let's look at it the other way. Is he likely to get in trouble in the future, say in the next 15 years, if he does it over? LaTeX 2E isn't going to change. So, if he's happy with LaTeX 2E, keep using LaTeX 2E. He wants to use the features of LaTeX 3, use the features of LaTeX 3, and be committed to it. Yeah, except for, I, I, I'm certainly, sorry, I certainly disagree with Carney on, on several occasions. <laughs> 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 the future. I, I agree that, that 2E is, 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 it will not change. It will, will 2 or 9 doesn't change. 2 or 9 right. exists. If you, if you are prepared to, Run two or nine. You have to build these days your own format because it isn't going to be shipped anymore. But it is there. Uh, my ideal would be certainly to offer some level of document backward compatibility in terms of input format, so that you can have your old stuff run in in, in LaTeX. Latex 3 format, and that eventually people actually wouldn't use the old stuff anymore. So, whereas Carl firmly believes that will never happen. So whatever that the situation is, um, not in the lifetimes of anybody in this room, anyway. <laughs> not in the lifetime of anybody in this room. 
Well, we got it. It was, it was too aligned to be doing a couple of things. But that was... Uh, totally different. <laughs> 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 okay, anyway, we're spraying. If, if I may edgewise, edgewise, I think that the cost of shipping an extra format like like a 2D will going to be much less with the new, uh, with the new discs and new uh, bandwidth, much less than hundreds and hundreds of person hours put into LaTeX 3 and packages of LaTeX 3. So I agree with Carl. It will just it will be always easier to ship this format to everybody than to try. But this is not what I'm trying to say. What I'm trying to say is if you have a certain portion of stuff like like for example two or nine, I mean the situation is clearly different, but two or nine, there were style files. The style files still are called dot style. But not many of the 2E two, two, two style files would run on top of LaTeX 2 or 9. Right. So the, the answer is, you, you, for your old documents, it will certainly be the right thing to have a format running there. But I think over time, if, if it actually works, you will end up with less functionality to, if you stay on building new stuff, on the old form. Absolutely true. Right? And that's why people were spam. <laughs> well, yes, that's possible. And this is what, why LaTeX 2 or 9 nearly sort of killed 2 Epsilon because on this continent nobody could understand that people wouldn't need access. <laughs> yeah, I mean, right, possible. So, um, um, philosophical. Is there uh, a big difference between LaTeX 3 or EXTL 3 with respect to memory footprint, like the high watermark and registers allocated or double register allocated? Or it's, it, it's, it's a large... This is, this, is, this is where I said, when we had the original ideas, and then interestingly enough, they, 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 they had turned out to be still relevant after 20 years, which was in 1991. We build the kernel of the full LaTeX system in, in that version of Excel 3 we had back then. And it actually compiled and, and run and docu could, could produce documents. The full set on, but. Predating, it, it predating was, ETEC? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, it was impossible to use because uh, it was so slow and it was using so much memory, you basically. Uh, it was it was built for a different age. Uh, the idea, but yeah, um, was, so so yes, it, it poses more requirement <laughs> as compared to the current term. But uh, but not significantly more than other large. These days it doesn't matter. Packages. I mean, this is why 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 it is nowadays mm -hmm. possible to easily run um, font and uh, in two e. Font includes the whole set of, of, of that language in, into on top of the current old language that LaTeX uh, 2E uses. So it's even using currently more memory than it would use in a complete LaTeX 3 format. So how far into a 32,768 register bank was these formats? That, that registers are, 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 are really big issues. Uh, okay, so it's just dictionaries. It's just. It's just cleaner processing, not optimizing for speed. It's, it's, I mean, LaTeX 2 Epsilon is like, like the GNU's, GNU's tech program. It was optimized for the last bit. Because, I mean, back then, when I started with LaTeX, I saw LaTeX and thought it was nice, the 2 or 9 version. I couldn't get it loaded. It, it died on me on my PC because I had only 512K and it didn't load into that. So, yeah, the situation has changed completely. So, no, I don't think there is, as far as the format is going to um, be concerned, uh, whatever comes on top of, of, of that layer, that is going to be the, the issue anyway. I can say as a user running many, talk about documents, uh, there's no noticeable difference in speed. The thing uses LaTeX 3 or just LaTeX. And in fact, I find that the output to the terminal is by far the slowest thing in the whole process. And so when I wrote, that's why I wrote my little script, text bot, which throws away almost everything and goes to the terminal, and then it's vastly faster. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're getting to the point that we throw out a lot of those messages. Yeah. yeah. I mean, who, who needs to see it? 
Well, anyway, maybe we should talk. Yeah, let's, well, let's thank this. Yeah. Well,